Metropolitan Community Church, and I'm glad that you are here. Uh, it is a you know, crazy uh, time that we are living in, and it is a beautiful time that we can be here together in, in worship and uh, with precautions. And uh, people were greeted with a squirt of hand sanitizer coming in. Things have been sanitized, doors and tabletops. And then also our chairs have been distanced also. So we've got the social distancing going on. And, and we are grateful that we can be in community together. It's a fabulous thing. So namaste, everybody. And we welcome all of you who are watching online. Thank you for being with us today. And I want you to feel a part of the service. So go ahead and and get your communion elements ready so you can join us a little bit later for communion. The rest of us, I invite you to get your Keeping in Touch card out right now and fill it out on both sides and uh, place it in the offering basket in just a little bit, which is up here. We will not be passing the offering basket today. Um, so just out of the abundance of caution. And uh, we are in this all together, aren't we? And uh, hallelujah, <coughs> praise God. We've got some announcements. Yes. Keep on coming, Pastor Caveman. So last week, we had the annual Children's Sunday School Bake Sale, and we want to thank you all so much for your participation through the cakes that were donated, decorated by the kids, and auctioned by Gregory Ragsdell. We were able to raise over $900 for the ministries of this church. So congratulations. It was so fun to have our youngest members enthusiastic enthusiastically with us, even if it was sugar-induced. <laughs> so as you know, yesterday we are participated in the Uptown Community Service Center's um, Walk-a-Thon, and in combination with other participants and your funds, we are at an over $5,000 fundraising amount for Uptown Community Service Center, and so we just want to share that with you, and thank you again for walking and donating and supporting the agencies that we collaborate with to work with homelessness. Yesterday, we hosted the first of three wisdom gatherings where we're talking about the stories and the experience of becoming this church in light of our 50th anniversary this year. So yesterday, we had two of our founding members present telling stories about how we came into existence the difficulties that we faced, the triumphs, the ways God provided miraculously, and all the things. So we hope you'll mark your calendars. The next two wisdom gatherings are coming up April 25th and May 9th, well, where we will focus on the next 40 years of our history. Many of you have expressed an interest in taking your spiritual journey to the next level by committing yourself to membership here at the Met. And others of you have expressed an interest in being baptized or renewing your baptism in MCC. So in preparation for um, a membership ritual on Easter Sunday and a baptism, we have scheduled the membership class on April 4th to Saturday from 10 a.m. to 11.30. We will have a sign-up sheet in the social hall next week, so please RSVP if you're interested in attending the membership course or considering baptism. Also, coming up soon is Holy Week, and we, on Good Friday, we'll have a service where we focus on the crucifixion of Christ, and we'll be putting on a play of the 14 Stations of the Cross through the eyes of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we need 14 readers to participate, so if you are interested in being a reader at the Good Friday service, you can talk to Reverend Allie, myself, or Pastor Dan, and we will get you the beautiful floral arrangement in front of the altar this morning is from Rose Turner, who attends the 9 o'clock ser service in honor of Women's History Month with the dedication. I salute the women of MCC San Diego who have supported this ministry of love for one another. Their unwavering support has kept us strong. And then the floral arrangement in front of the podium is from David Root. And it's in acknowledgement and gratitude to the founders and the pillars of this community over the years. At this time, it's my joy to invite any of our elementary school aged children to start heading to the back of the sanctuary to meet your Sunday school teachers. And we will carry on with worship. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. You know, when we have a time of greeting.
reading together today. We are, will not be doing the touching, but I just acknowledge and want to admonish us to do this namaste. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful greeting that says, the highest good in me honors the highest good in you, or the Christ in me honors the Christ in you. And so may we greet one another with that today. Please rise as you are able as our worship begins. And namaste, everybody. Greetings. Greetings. All you online, welcome. Welcome you are here. We come. 
home to the well of anger and hate. These waters flourish all the land. Healer, bring us to the water of peace and hope. Jesus, bring us to the well of salvation. Amen. Please be seated. In celebration of the Met's 50th anniversary, we are highlighting women pioneers from MCC's impressive history. Today's featured woman is a pioneer in MCC's social justice activity on the East Coast. Reverend Elder Pat Baumgartner is currently the senior pastor of Metropolitan Community Church of New York, where she has served in various capacities for the past 33 years. Reverend Pat is also the executive director of the Global Justice Institute, traveling, writing, and speaking on behalf of MCC Worldwide, addressing a range of social issues, forging on-the-ground partnerships, and supporting efforts to promote an inclusive human rights agenda. She chairs the moderator's public policy team and holds a seat on the Council for Global Equality. The founder of the Sylvia Rivera Memorial Food Pantry at MCC New York and Sylvia's Place, she has become a leading visionary in the quest of the queer community to build coalitions and deal with hunger and homelessness, as well as homophobia and other prejudices. Named for the late civil rights leader and MCC member Sylvia Rivera, Sylvia's Place serves as New York City's emergency shelter dedicated to providing safe space, food, medical and psychological care, as well as spiritual support for homeless LGBT youth. Educated in the Roman Catholic tradition, Reverend Pat Baumgartner has become a sought after speaker and preacher across denominational divides and has been the recipient of numerous awards, serving as the 2011 New York City Pride Grand Marshal. Her current focus involves work with activists in Costa Rica, East Africa, Brazil, Mexico, and Eastern Europe, working with asylum seekers in New York City and developing presentations that address human trafficking as a queer rights issue. The proud grandparent of four-year-old Joshua, she lives in the West Village of New York City with her spouse of 28 years, Mary Jane Gibney, and their puppy, Lily. You can learn more about Reverend Pat and other women in MCC by visiting the Women's History Month display in the social hall. Please join me in celebrating the incredible legacy of Reverend Elder Pat Baumgartner today for Women's History Month.
It is a beautiful day today that you've given us. And your deep love for us is ever, ever evident everywhere. Thank you, God. And God, hear our prayers. And may we find our song as we continue our journey through this Lenten season. God, I think most people have never prayed a prayer of transformation. We walk with them and pray. We pray for tweaking. We want you to tweak this and tweak that. To be honest, God, we don't necessarily want our lives transformed most of the time. It sounds attractive in a moment of blissful, holy, idealistic exuberance or at the moment of crisis, but every day. Reality is, we more often like to distance ourselves from the inner work required to bring about transformation. Oh yes, we want change, but not real transformation. And we don't want the pain or the work that is necessary. At times there seems to be this feeling, God, the feeling that we're down here living with the real reality. And you're up there watching. That is all. You're just watching. May we know that there is no, there is so much more coming from you. Teach us to have joy with all you have planned for us and for the people of our times. We pray for change. Then we wonder, why God? Why don't you answer our prayers? I think, God, you are not in the business of tweaking, but rather in real transformation. You want to turn our lives upside down, which is really the right side up, if we want to see something incredible. Help us to pray in earnest for honest and open transformation. May humility guide our efforts to be reconciled with you and live forever in your abundant grace. As with your encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, who invite us to come and see. God, you know all about us. You value us. You love us beyond all that we could possibly comprehend. We invite you into our lives today. Help us to make ourselves available to you, to become the best version of ourselves by seeking your will and becoming living examples of you and your love in the world. Open our hearts. Give us strength to commit to grow closer to you each day. Guide our path. Fill our hearts with gratitude, patience, strength, and peace. May we enjoy uncertainty and clarity in times of decision. May we have strong courage when we are afraid. Today, God, we are living with the coronavirus brings about much fear for some of us. May we find the calmness and the steady reassurance that you are in charge and you are taking care of it as well as us. May we feel you and know that your spirit of love are with us this morning, this week, and always. Open our hearts and ears this morning as we feel you through song, scripture, and the words in our message. And then may we go out and pass your love to all we meet, to all we see, and may your blessings and love be ever present. We ask all of this as together we join the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Jesus replied, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty. No, the water I give will become fountains within them, springing up to provide eternal life. The woman said to Jesus, give me this water so that I won't grow thirsty and have to keep coming all the way here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and then come back here. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. You're right, you don't have a husband, Jesus explained. The fact is, you've had five, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. So what you've said is quite true. I can see you're a prophet, answered the woman. The woman then left her water jar and went off into the town. She said to the people, come and see someone who told me everything I have ever done. Could this be the Messiah? At that, everyone set out from town to meet Jesus. Many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus on the strength of the woman's testimony that he told me everything I ever did. This is the message of hope. Praise to you, creator of Christ and Holy Spirit. Chose a song 
for each person in the tribe. And the women, when they became pregnant, would go out. They would pray about what that person's song was. They would come back to the tribe, tell the tribe the song. And then when the baby was born, they would sing that song to the baby. And then during significant moments in that person's life, moments when they needed to be reminded of who they were, the tribe would sing their song to them. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. The last couple of Sundays, Pastor Dan has reminded us that when we are tempted, we can find our song again through words of honesty with God and through words of hope. And he shared with us that as we listen to Jesus and allow him to raise us up out of fear, we find our song. I don't know about you, but I'm deeply moved by the tribal story that pastors Caden and Dan have been sharing with us. Because throughout my life, there have been people at different points who have just been able to see me and understand me on a soul level. And at times in my life when I felt like I was lost or in the wilderness, those people were the ones who could remind me who I was. When I read this morning's text from the Gospel of John, I wondered how the woman at the well felt when Jesus saw her and knew her life. Can you imagine? Without her saying even a single word, seeing her so deeply that there was nothing she could hide, Nothing she could keep private from him. But before I could really experience the power of that, I had to let go of the previous interpretations that I've heard around this scripture passage. And I don't know about you, but I've heard more than one sermon on this passage, calling out the sexual indiscretions of the woman at the well, while ignoring the behavior of the men in the story, as if, as if she alone is responsible for these relationships. And I've heard many explanations about the sinfulness of this woman, even though Jesus does not name her behavior as sinful in the text. He simply names it. And within the context of the text, it appears that he is naming it to make clear to her that he is the Messiah. Because who else could know something that she hasn't told? Theologian Nancy Rockwell explains that Jesus offered the woman at the well the first cup of the water of eternal life by explaining to her that he was the Messiah. And when he told the woman at the well about her sexual relationships, he did not condemn her. Rockwell wrote that Jesus lifts her from obscurity, from her Samaritan identity, from social disgrace and marginalization by this intentional honor. And Pastor David Lowe agrees that Jesus never at any point asked the woman at the well to repent for her behavior. According to Pastor Lowe's, the woman at the well may have been widowed, or abandoned, or divorced. And she could have been living with a man in a Levite marriage, which in Jesus' day was when a childless woman was married to her deceased husband's brother to produce an heir. So these commentators felt the same desire that I did to restore the woman at the well's reputation to show her as a powerful messenger of God's truth and love. And for 50 years of the Metropolitan Community Church of San Diego, we have felt called to restore those who were told they were less than because of their sexuality, who were unfairly judged or marginalized and oppressed because of their gender, or gender fluidity, or their race, or any other outside imposed label. I wanted 
to share with you my struggle with the previous interpretations of this text. Because once I started to let go of those messages, I could see the beauty of what's there. Because what I saw was Jesus seeing the woman at the well in a deep and profound way. He was reminding her of her life story in this intense way that probably made her feel vulnerable. But in the midst of all that vulnerability, Jesus reminded the woman at the well who she really was. Jesus met this woman and saw her in a complete way. And in that seeing, he didn't just see her sexuality or her relationships. He also saw her potential to be his messenger and to bring others to him. It was as if Jesus, just like the tribe we learned about, was singing this woman's song to her, reminding her who she was. So imagine for a moment that you are the woman at the well. But in our time, you encounter Jesus while running a daily errand in aisle six of the grocery store, perhaps. I'm not even certain what's in aisle six of the grocery store, but it's not toilet paper, hand sanitizer, or grinder. <laughs> Jesus looks at you, and immediately, you see something's different about this man. Jesus asks you for help. But you notice that Jesus is taller than you, and it's strange. It's strange that he would be speaking to you, asking you to help him get that bottle of water that's on the highest top shelf. And you look at Jesus, and you think, what is going on here? And then Jesus tells you something about your life that is completely private, that he really should not know. And you can see that Jesus really knows you. He knows your life story. He knows the places inside you where you feel wounded. He knows all the places you've looked for love and for comfort. He knows the challenges you face and the ways you've been judged. He sees where you feel guilt and shame. But incredibly, that's not all he sees. He also sees your value. He sees your worth. He sees the potential in you that you haven't even seen yet. And he looks past what everybody else sees, the skin and the bones and the social and class status and the labels of gender and race, and he sees your soul. And when he does, he says, I have a gift of life and love to offer you. A water that will forever quench your thirst. Jesus says, the water that I will give you will become a spring of water gushing out to eternal life. But that's not all. Jesus knows all your gifts. He knows what you have to contribute. And Jesus knows that you have the potential to share his message, to teach other people about his love, to help heal other people in the planet. Not someone else, not some other leader who is somehow more worthy, but you, and you, and all of you. Right now, all around us, there's a lot of fear and panic. And the coronavirus feels like a dark storm cloud on our horizon, with the first drops of rain and rushing winds heading our way. Some people are losing jobs, losing money as the stock market falls, and stockpiling supplies. 
and the fear of illness and death has begun rising up in our own minds. The fear of losing people that we love and care about. It's present when, within us, even when we don't name it. The storm is coming, or it's already here, and we're just trying to figure out what does this mean for our daily lives, because every day our daily lives are changing, right? Yeah. Every three hours there's another message on your phone about the latest news story. Our schools are closing. And our sporting events and our social activities have been canceled. Right? Our city is shutting down. And this was the part that was hardest for my inner gay man to accept. Broadway was canceled. <laughs> As each day brings new changes for us, we're all trying to cope in different ways with the fears that rise up within us. And these fears stimulate that primitive response in the amygdalas of our brains. And that primitive response, it kept us alive as cave people many you know, years ago, but it's not always helpful for how we react now, is it? Many of you have heard before that fear triggers a fight, flight, or freeze response for us as humans. And if it triggers a fight response, we might be looking for someone to blame for this virus. And this desire to blame can lead to racism, xenophobia, and aggression to people of Asian descent, or a willingness to wrestle someone at the store for the last hand sanitizer. <laughs> If it triggers a flight response, we might be frantically stockpiling supplies, enough toilet paper and food and household goods to last us for a year. And we might have the desire to hide. And if it triggers a freeze response, then we might feel immobilized, unable to respond to what's happening, numb. We might just want to deny it. In the midst of all of these feelings, we have a choice. We have a choice about how we will respond. What will each of us do during the fear? We have options. We can pray and we can meditate. In those moments when the fear and the panic starts to rise up within us, we can take a deep breath and breathe in the Spirit, breathe in the Spirit of God. And we can seek out the facts. Right? Instead of obsessing on the news stories, which is easy to do, and only pay attention to what keeps us informed. And we can reach out to our neighbors and any people that we know who might be vulnerable to the virus. And we can start creating support networks yes. for our neighborhood and our communities. We can choose to let fear and panic be in control, or we can listen to Jesus singing to us, mm -hmm. reminding us who we are, that we belong to God that we are God's beloved, that there is no illness, there is no death, there is no tragedy that can separate us from God's love. And as people are in need during this time, we can look for the ways to prepare for people's needs. If we have extra money, we can donate. We can become part of a phone tree or a care team here at the church that's reaching out and checking on people. We can start gathering resources. When fear rises up within us, we often feel like we want to shut down emotionally or 
we want to withdraw, or we want to hold on to everything we have really tightly in case we're not going to have enough. <coughs> but when we hear Jesus singing to us, Jesus reminds us that we are called to love people in practical ways. Jesus sings to us and reminds us that it makes a difference how we respond as a church, how we respond as individuals, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So how will you be God's love? How will you be God's healing? How will you help to transform the fear that is happening around you? And as Jesus reminds you who you are, what song is Jesus singing to you? Let us pray. God, help us to remember and know that you are not abandoning us, that you will never abandon us. Help us to know that we are the church, and even when we cannot meet together in person, we are connected through your spirit. God, when we miss the touch of others, may we feel you holding us and reminding us that your love is ever present and it always remains. God, please give us wisdom in the coming days as we seek to care for our health and the health of others and let us send out our loving and healing prayers for everyone in our community of faith, our country, and our world. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Reverend Ellie, and it's, it's great to have you back home. Thank you. Uh, earlier this week, one of the devotions that I read was uh, focused on the the story where everybody's putting their offering in and the little old lady comes up and she's got, she puts a little tiny bit in. And one of the things that resonated with me as Allie was preaching was that this was an example of how Jesus knew this person. He knew her. He knew her story. He knew that even though she was just putting a little pittance in, that she was giving all she had. Because he knew her. Like he knew the woman of the well. Jesus knows us, he knows you, he knows me, and he knows what we're capable of, and he knows what it's right for us to give right now. And it also struck me as uh, rather interesting that I read this devotional that was, you know, decided what was gonna be in that book a year and a half, two years ago. And I was gonna bring to mind the way that we used to collect the offering, or the way they did collect the offering in the days of Jesus, and that is by people coming up and putting it in as opposed to passing the basket around. And so that brings us to the uh, those logistical changes that we're making in this service. Um, the way it's going to work is the ushers will come to the aisle and dismiss people by aisle and come and bring your offering and keeping in touch cards and put them in the basket. Or if you prefer, we have boxes that are mounted by each of the exit doors and you can put them in there. Um, this is one of the ways that we're adapting in order to get through this current healthcare crisis that we're in, because we stick together and we support each other. And we're going to get through this thing because we support each other with God's loving arms wrapped around us. So I invite everybody to look at this part of the service as an, an, another opportunity to worship God. And God bless us, everyone.
please join me in prayer. God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to pull together and to give of our resources in order to put the message out there, put the word out there that the realm of God is here, that God loves us, and that you will never leave us alone. And together, we are pulling our resources to get that word out there. May these resources be blessed in Jesus' name. Now we come to the time in our service where we get to participate in something that is very communal, and that is Holy Communion. And so I invite all of you who are watching with us on live stream to participate with us also, and even join us in the great Thanksgiving. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and grace. It is right, and a good and a joyful thing, both now and always to give thanks to you almighty God creator of heaven and earth and so we join our voices with those angels and with those saints who have already gone on before us as they declare santo 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 eres Dios holy 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 are you God let us pray loving God we come to you this day with open hearts for you see us you know us inside and out and sing our song to us. And we ask for your mercy and forgiveness as we acknowledge the ways that we have wandered from your path. In the face of fear, uncertainty, despair, injustice, frustration, grief, and poverty, we have sought meaning and purpose in things and beings other than you. We now take a moment of silent reflection to confess the ways in which fear overtakes us and we forget that we are the salt and light.
for us the body and blood of Christ as we each understand that to be, that we may experience the presence of Jesus the Christ. So breathe your spirit in us, that we may reclaim Christ and faithfully follow into the future you have for us. Amen. At MCC San Diego, and at every MCC around the globe, we celebrate an open communion. And what that means is that you do not need to be a member of this church or any church to participate in communion. When you come forward to receive, a sanitized hand server will hand you a wafer that has been dipped in juice. And as you serve yourself, that person will say a brief blessing over you. And if you are choosing to remain in your seat today, know that God meets you where you are. You are in communion with God and with the Holy Spirit. Afterward, you may return to your seat and meditate on the blessings of this day. As you ready yourself and follow the directions of the ushers, all that we ask is that you
rightly, even so this week, as we leave here now, hearing the song that God has in our hearts, in the name of God, our Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Have a great week, everybody. Peace.